I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to today's um, presentation. Our presentation is um, about a recent book written by Vivian Heller, and we're lucky enough to have her with us today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it first. Analysis and Exile, Boyhood, Loss, and the Lessons of Anna Freud is the story of the childhood and youth of Peter Heller, Vivian's father, one of the first children to be psychoanalyzed by Anna Freud, and one of the 20 students invited to attend her experimental school, um, the Hitzing School in 1920s Vienna. Um, during this time, of course, uh, in the, in, throughout the 30s, Vienna starts sliding into fascism. And, uh, and as a result of that, he um, eventually flees to England and is deported to Canada, where he is interned um, in an internment camp uh, there. Um, so to tell this story, Vivian Heller uh, uses a wealth of sources, including her father's case history, very interesting, I think, and his internment diary. I'm using novelistic techniques to bring the past alive. I'm going to tell you about Vivian Heller. She is a writer of fiction and nonfiction. She received her PhD in English literature and modern studies from Yale University. She is the author of Joyce, Decadence, and Emancipation, which won the Choice Book Award and a history of the building of the New York subway, the city beneath us. She has published essays and short stories in the Georgetown Review, Confrontation, Bomb, Fence, and elsewhere. She's taught at Bennington, Barnard, and Bard Colleges, and currently she is a lecturer at Columbia University's program in narrative medicine and a writing consultant at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. Um, so Vivian, I wanted to welcome you today. And uh, I will actually turn uh, my camera and sound off as well. And you can begin the presentation and uh, just let me know when you're finished, I'll come back. So first of all, thank you so much, Michael, for that introduction. And thanks to Leo Beck for inviting me to speak today. Um, I also just wanna thank my wonderful publishers at Confer Books and all of you who are attending online and special thanks to my family in Vienna, in Argentina, and here in the US. So when my father was in his 60s and I was in my 30s, he reluctantly gave me one of his books. I had been pressing him to give it to me. When he finally did, he said, you really might not want to read it, and that's quite all right. This note of apology mixed with warning went right into me. I didn't read the book closely until long after he had died. When I did, it opened up an entire world to me. The title of that book was A Child Analysis with Anna Freud. It consisted of my father's case history as recorded by Anna Freud from when he was nine to 12 years old. Um, it also included the reflections, reminiscences, critiques and questions that he had added half a century later. How did he come by his case history? Anna Freud had sent him a folder of the poems and stories he had given her as a child, adding, I also have your case history. Would you like me to have it sent to you upon my death or would you like it to be destroyed? My father said that he wanted her to send him his case history right away. And after a long back and forth, she finally agreed even though she had never done anything like this before. So this book and the internment diary that my father wrote as a young man were the primary sources for my book. I'd like to begin by reading the fateful dream that brought my father to Anna Freud's office at Berggasse 19 in Vienna. Um, for those of you who have the book, this is pages three to four. It's the very beginning of the book. When my father was a little boy in Vienna, he told Anna Freud this dream. He is walking on the rim of the white gravel path that leads around the oval pond in the upper part of the Belvedere Gardens. The birds are singing, the sun is out, his hands are in his pockets, he's whistling to himself. Suddenly he becomes aware of a distant rumbling that seems to be coming from the lower part of the garden. He looks down the path and doesn't see anything at first. Then a blue black machine with a brilliant array of handles and shafts comes into sight. 
It is flattening the gravel, making it level and smooth. The machine is heading straight towards him. He tries to get up off the path onto the soft green grass, but even though it's only a matter of a few inches, he can't lift his feet. The machine comes closer and closer, finally catching him up and pressing him with its huge rods and shafts. He calls out for help as loud as he can, but no one comes to rescue him. There is nothing he can do. The machine grinds him up. Night after night, this dream kept coming back so that he was afraid to fall asleep, but sleep always caught up with him in the end, no matter how hard he tried to resist. Sometimes he woke up in the kitchen, face down on the stone floor. Other times he woke up in a bath of ice cold water. He knew that he had been screaming because his voice was hoarse. Sometimes there were bruises on his arms and legs. Anna Freud told my father that she knew something about dreams and that by putting their heads together, they could probably make his dream go away. And so a conversation began that lasted for the next four years and that played itself back to him for the rest of his life. So it soon became clear that a key element in my father's case was the breakup of his parents' marriage. His mother, Margareta Steiner had abandoned my father when he was four years old. She was brilliant, artistic, charismatic, and unhappy in her marriage, and determined to pursue a career in film. His father, Hans Heller, a wealthy candy manufacturer, had agreed on a separation, provided that Peter would remain with him. Margareta, also known as Mem, agreed, knowing that in her new life, she wouldn't have the means to provide for her son. However, she often came to visit him, and these visits were the occasion of excitement, joy, and tremendous disappointment when she went away again. Anna Freud became one of the several mother figures in his life. Of all of them, she was far and away the most powerful. The next passage that I'd like to read from the book um, describes my father's sessions with Anna Freud at Berggasse 19. Um, this would be on pages 9 through 12. So let me just get there. Okay. While his mother struggled to find her way, Peter had his sessions with Anna Freud, which followed the same pattern every day. The chauffeur would pick him up from the evangelical elementary school in his father's Italian sports car and drop him off at 19 Berggasse. Walking up the worn marble steps to the second floor, he would run his hand from knob to knob of the iron railing, counting to himself. When he finally got to the door, he peered through the little glass spy hole, trying to see if the doorkeeper was peering back at him. In the waiting area, he kept his eyes on Sigmund Freud's door, and now and then he caught a glimpse of him, thin and bent, with a, belt, with a balding head and a gray beard, sitting at an enormous desk crowded with ancient figurines. Everyone said that Sigmund Freud was a very great man, but when Peter actually crossed paths with him, he would simply say in a faint, mumbling voice, as though he had a piece of unchewed food in his mouth, is this really the Heller boy? My, how you've grown, exactly as any other grown-up would. In Anna's office, there weren't any figurines, only a portrait of Sigmund Freud that followed Peter with its eyes. The portrait couldn't see him when he lay down on the couch, which made up for the fact that he couldn't see Anna, even though he was often tempted to twist around and check whether she was really listening to him. Since he wasn't allowed to look at her, he looked instead at Wolfie, a coal black German shepherd with sharp yellow teeth that lay on a tattered rug with his head between his paws. He was afraid of Wolfie the first few times, but after that he mainly felt sorry for him, trapped indoors all day without any hope of going outside. Sometimes just the clicking of Anna's needles made Peter want to jump off the couch, run around the room, and knock her lace-covered tables down. If only Wolfie would leap up and bark like mad. He knew just how to get him to do it, but it wasn't allowed. As time went on, Peter learned ways of distracting himself without Anna noticing. If he squinted, for example, he could make out the titles of her books, 
even though the glass-covered bookshelf was halfway across the room. Once she let him take down a book and leaf through it, even though, strictly speaking, it was against her rules. It was by the philosopher Nietzsche. She had his complete works, which took up, entire, which took up two entire shelves. I want to be a great writer, he told her. My father says that a great writer must have read everything. He rattled off the title of some of the books that Hans had read to him, hoping that she would notice how advanced they were. No answer, just the snoring of Wolfie on his, rugs, on his rug and the clicking of her knitting needles. Was she even listening? He was nothing to her, just another one of her customers. Why had he ever thought that she was beautiful with her drab clothes and her hair pulled back in a bun? She was only really interested in hearing about shameful things, things that normal people, like his nursemaid Taisy, considered piggish and disgusting, like his habit of spying on men in the public toilet. He didn't know why he had to come here every day. Wasn't it just a waste of time? She didn't even think it was that important to be great. She said that it was more important to develop into a real human being, whatever that meant. How could a grown person not care about being great? Didn't it bother her that she was going to die? Her own father had written that there was no such thing as God, which meant that when you died, you just evaporated into space and your atoms scattered across the universe. The only way not to disappear was to be great, like Goethe or Shakespeare or Karl May, who had written at least 100 adventure books. If you couldn't be immortal like Zeus, at least you could be immortal in words, like the creator of Faust or the author of Winnetou. Sometimes he hated the sound of her voice, so reasonable and steady and matter-of-fact. Other times he wondered what would happen if he broke all of her rules, fell down on his knees, and hugged her legs. She told him to draw pictures of his dreams, even though drawing really wasn't what he did the best. She liked looking at his drawings, no matter how sloppy they were, and would ask him what every squiggle meant. He made his drawings more and more elaborate so that he could stretch out the time of sitting right next to her on the couch. She didn't use perfume the way his mother did, but she smelled nice anyway. Still, he wished that she would pay less attention to his drawings and more attention to his stories, because, as his father said, a writer needs an audience. She didn't want to use all their time hearing him read his stories out loud. She said that it was more useful for him to lie on the couch and say whatever came into his head. He could still tell her his stories, but they came out sounding more like dreams, and he often forgot important details when she was telling them to her, when he was telling them to her, only remembering them later when the driver was speeding him back home. Finally, she told him that if he brought his stories to her, she would read them in the evening when her sessions were done. He pictured her sitting in her red velvet armchair late at night, with Wolfie lying at her feet and his pages in her hands. He gave her a ten-page novella that he had finished before he started coming to her, all about a factory owner who starts out wanting to kill himself and ends up deciding to stay alive after he starts a revolution in the factory. She liked the story so much that she typed it up for him, and she typed up all his stories after that, keeping them in a special drawer along with her own papers so that they wouldn't get lost. In a way, Anna was like a mother to him, or maybe a cross between a mother and a scientist. She never hugged him or kissed him the way his mother did, and she wouldn't let him hug or kiss her, although it was all right for him to talk about wanting to. But she knew things about him that not even Mem knew, things that he had never planned on telling anyone, like what happened to his body when he got excited, or the fact that he sometimes wet his bed. What I discovered is that Anna's office was not only a place of therapy for my father, it was also a place of education. Anna was a mother, analyst, educator, all in one. The goal of therapy was not simply to alleviate symptoms, but to help child patients become whole human beings. Anna Freud's role as educator was deepened by my father's attendance of the Hitzing School, the experiment in education undertaken by Anna Freud, Eva Rosenfeld, and Tiffany Aris Dorothy Burlingham. 
The main teachers were Eric Erickson and Peter Bloss, and there were never more than 20 students at one time. The Hitzing School was progressive, it was project oriented, and it was psychologically enlightened. It, is, it was an example of the flowering of what became known as Red Vienna in the 1920s and 1930s, and early 1930s. This was a period of progressive experimentation that was reflected in education, public housing, social welfare, taxation, as well as literature, music, art, design, and architecture. The Hitzing School constituted a sheltered, idealistic, and very intimate world, one in which anti-Semitism had no real place. Here and in his therapy, my father was led into a way of seeing things that was rational, utopian, and enlightened. But even as a child, his tendency was to aggressively question everything. And that emerges in the passage I'd like to read to you next. Um, this would be on pages 67 and 68. Is there such a thing as Warträume, dreams of prophecy? Peter asks Tazy one day. Tazy again is his nursemaid. He already knows better than to ask Anna. Tazy, who will one day become a respected analyst in her own right, tells him without hesitation, no. There are no Vartoime. This teaching goes along with the principle that every emotion can be translated into a thought. Reason can illuminate and disentangle the maze of the past. Imagination without reason cannot tell us what we will become. There are no Vartoime. This is not only an assertion of rationality, but an assertion of faith. And yet how fragile this inward seeking faith will seem in just a few more years. Peter reads Traven's The Death Ship, a picaresque novel about an American sailor who spends a night with a prostitute and misses his ship. Without identity papers, he becomes an unwanted alien and is kicked around from one port to another. In the midst of reading this book, he has a nightmare that he is drowning, and he runs screaming to Tazy's bed. Anna Freud notes, he doesn't want to admit that he has screamed, says it was because of the fever. To explain his exclamation while sick, he read the novel The Ship of the Dead that deals with the destiny of stateless people who have no passport and are shipped from one country to another. At the end of this note, Anna sums up her thoughts. Stateless, parentless equals Peter. But why would a little boy be interested in a book about what it means to be stateless? This question is not important to Anna Freud. What is key is that he feels parentless. Immediacy borrows its intensity from what it draws up. The family romance is primary. And so Anna continues to write her, her notes. Meanwhile, it's 1931 and the clock is ticking. As a 60-year-old man trying to feel his way back into his own past with the aid of Anna Freud's notes, Peter will regret the fact that he was told that there was no such thing as a prophetic dream. He will wonder how he would have developed if he hadn't grown up in such a skeptical world. He will regret the fact that so little real authority was granted to the synthetic power of poetic imagination, and so much emphasis was placed on analysis. He will think there was something admirable about his mother's commitment to telling stories and realizing herself as an artist, despite all the pain she caused him. And he will point out with stubborn insistence that not everything that Anna said was true. When he and his cousin were fleeing Austria, for example, they had to show the books they were carrying, and his cousin happened to be carrying Traven's The Death Ship. The guard questioned his cousin about the book, and Peter talked back, with the result that they had to clean out the train station bathrooms on their hands and knees. He never forgot this moment at the border, which could easily have cost them their lives. Perhaps his childhood dream, triggered by reading the Traven book, had contained some seeds of prophecy after all. Perhaps there really were some other ways of reading dreams and reading reality. But during his formative childhood years, those ways had been closed off to him.
I'd now like to leap ahead to 1940. My father has fled Vienna and has just started to create a meaningful life for himself in Cambridge, England, only to be arrested as a foreign national and to be held in various camps, ultimately winding up as an internee in Canada. He is thrown in not only with other Jewish refugees, but also with Nazi POWs. It seems important to mention that in every camp he ends up in, there are several, the Jewish refugees immediately set up classes trying to hold on to culture, to civilization. The following passage takes place in Bury St. Edmunds, England, and it includes Victor Rosenfeld, son of one of the three founders of the Hitzing School, friend of his childhood, and companion in internment. So here we now see Peter in a new position. He is now the note taker, trying to make sense of a world that is fragmented and irrational. And this would be on pages 168, if I can get to it, yes, 168 and 169. Between hunger and classes and more hunger and endless debate, there are moments of reprieve. When it isn't raining, they are taken out to a field that lies between their barracks and the street. Although the field is overgrown with nettles and weeds, there are patches of soft grass here and there. While the guards look on in their stiff uniforms, the internees unbutton their shirts and bathe in the sun. One afternoon, he and Vicky wrestle in the field, exactly as they did when they were little boys. Afterwards, they lie on their backs and stare up at the racing clouds. Do you ever think of Vienna, Peter asks, rolling onto a stomach and picking apart a dandelion. I try my best not to, Vicky replies, but it's our city, not anymore. Peter turns his head and gazes at the street, littered with bits of paper and orange peel. Children are playing on another street. He can hear their shouts off in the distance. Three girls pass by, giggling at the sight of so many young men and they are immediately greeted by a flurry of whistles and calls. For once, the guards don't intervene, looking on impassively. Discussions are their main way of passing the time, but many of their discussions explode into fights. A short Polish Jew, very thin, with a pockmarked face, loves to argue with a fanatical, bitterly humorous Jew who holds that rational thought is valuable, not because it's right, but because it's a means of prevailing over circumstance. They play out this battle over and over again, never growing tired of it. A rabbi says to a socialist, one day the Messiah will come and everyone will stand up in their graves. How can anyone in their right mind still believe something like that? The socialist replies, shaking his head. So many problems are taken up. Peter goes around the hall with his journal in his hand, jotting down the various topics that are being discussed. Anti-Semitism, freedom of will, rights of inheritance, sine 2 minus cosine 2y. But the question that haunts all of them, even in their sleep, is the question of what will happen to them if Germany succeeds in conquering England. He is hungry, very hungry, for most of the day, and comforts himself by thinking of Indiana Krupfen, Viennese sponge cake, topped with chocolate and filled with whipped cream, zachertort, lobsters with mayonnaise. The food here is very bad. Stingy portions of bread, watery, unsweetened tea, a bit of canned fish or boiled cabbage here and there. Writing allows him to forget his hunger for a little while, but he never forgets that he is surrounded by barbed wire. How wonderful it would be to walk freely through the streets. Um, he writes, if there were no Hitler, and if it weren't for these horrible machines that I used to dream of when I was a little boy. Yes, the machine is coming up behind us, and if we walk along the manicured paths of the park and whistle carelessly to ourselves, it is suddenly upon us, snatching us up and pressing us up against its metal bars until there is nothing left of us. So... Caught up in the machine of history, Peter is subject to various systems of classification that he has no control over. In the final passage that I'll read to you today, we hear of the categories that were used to rank foreign nationals by the English government, 
and we see how those categories were rendered meaningless. So just by way of explanation for this passage, Class A designated those who were considered a potential security risk in England um, or to England. Class B designated those about whom the government were uncertain and who were therefore subject to certain restrictions. Class C designated those who were not considered a risk and who were only subject to peacetime restrictions. So these categories are kind of at play in the passage that I'm going to read to you next, the final passage. So, and it's in a chapter called Sea Legs, 1940. Um, okay. The deck of the ship is packed with men. Knees, elbows, and shoulders are pressing in on him. There must be at least a thousand of us here, someone says. Don't forget the German POWs, someone else replies. I heard that there are over 800 of them. Why are we being thrown together with that bunch? Think about it for a minute. It might not be such a bad thing. Under the Geneva Conventions, the Brits have to treat them like human beings. So what? So maybe it will spill over to us. But no one has bothered to tell them where they are going, even though this is one of their rights. One man says they're going to be taken to Germany to be exchanged for the British prisoners taken at Dunkirk. Another says they're bound for Scotland to build roads and fortifications. A third man is convinced they're headed for Madagascar. Peter sticks to the theory of peat cutting in Canada. Why are they going to such trouble to get rid of us, a Cambridger remarks. Everyone I talk to is category B and C. They probably ran out of category A and they're filling some kind of quota, the other replies. Typical. After hours of standing on the deck, they are herded into the hold of the ship. The walls are covered with barbed wire, and so is the door. There are machine guns in the gun rests in the corners. They're pretty afraid of us, aren't they, someone remarks. Look at that sign, someone else exclaims. It says maximum capacity, 48 troops. The heavy smell of machine oil settles in Peter's throat. All they have for ventilation is a single fan. Hammocks are slung up between the, co the columns. Everyone scrambles for them. He crawls into a hammock underneath two others and throws his arm over his eyes. More, more hours pass, still no food or water and still no access to the latrines. Peter curls up in his hammock and tries to sleep despite the gurgling of his stomach. In this half state, he overhears Vicky and a man by the name of Bethany Holweg talk about the difference between sherry and cocktail parties. Absurd as it is, their conversation is comforting to him. They wouldn't be talking like that if the ship were going down. At 10 in the morning, they are brought to the latrines in groups, and then they are finally given something to eat. It's been 30 hours, the man next to him says. I wonder if they made the POWs wait this long. They are seated at tables, about 20 men at each, and serve generous portions of bacon, sweet porridge, Australian butter, and thick white bread. Real conversation becomes possible again, and even a bit of optimism. Returning to his hammock, Peter jots down a few impressions. Unshaven faces frozen in sleep, the weave of the hammock that casts a crisscross pattern over the scene, the stench of sweaty armpits and feet, the cradle of the hammock rocking back and forth. He wakes up to hear a man saying in an excited voice, but we've changed direction. There's no question of that. Why would we be going back to shore? I'll tell you why. There are German U-boats out there. And now he becomes conscious that his hammock is swimming, swinging more wildly than before. There is a cold, shivery feeling in the pit of his stomach. Men are jumping out of their hammocks and squatting down over buckets. The air is filled with the sound of coughing and spitting. The ship in front of us has been torpedoed, somebody says. That's why we've turned around. Are we going back to England? How the hell should I know? The miraculous rations continue to come. They gobble down the food greedily and then throw it up. There are troughs of vomit underneath the tables and there is a slick of vomit on the floor. Vomiting is discussed over meals. Some people demand that this be banned as a topic of conversation since just thinking about it is enough to bring it on. 
but the topic is impossible to suppress since vomiting takes up most of their day and the sour smell of vomit sat saturates the air. They see the German soldiers when the food is being given out. They look just as crisp and alert as they did when they first boarded the ship. We wouldn't look bad either if we were allowed on deck, someone remarks. I would give anything for a breath of fresh air. A 17-year-old soldier in an aviator's uniform is baited about the prospect of a Nazi victory. Exactly how will the Nazis divide the world? We'll leave that to the Fuhrer, the boy says with a shrug. So you have no idea, and yet you're willing to sacrifice your life? The boy smiles proudly and puffs out his chest. His whole being radiates certainty. More news. It's true that the ship before them was attacked. It was called the Erendora Star, and it was destroyed by a German U-boat commanded by Gunther Queen, a famous U-boat captain. Thanks to this decorated war hero, hundreds of men have drowned, a mixture of Jewish refugees and German POWs. Unbelievable, Peter hears one man exclaim. The Germans bungled and killed their own. Apparently the German POWs aren't much protection to us after all, another man remarks. They learn that the Ettrick was sent back to get a convoy and now it's back on course. Convoy or not, um, the sinking of the Arendora star proves that anything could happen to them. But there isn't time to panic or even to think in a world dominated by vomit and diarrhea. We're eating too much food, the Cambridger Ash proclaims. What's wrong with him, someone remarks. Does he want us to eat less and save the Brits some money? No, you idiot. He's afraid that we're using up our rations too fast and that nothing will be left over for the rest of the trip. The buckets and basins are full to overflowing. The men who can hold their food are in the minority. How are you Cambridgers doing, Peter hears someone say. Not too bad under the circumstances. Is it true that Blau threw up? What Blau? Oh, you mean Blau from King's College, like a, er like a heron. Someone runs to the bucket with his mouth full. Another runs after him. Gentlemen, please, let's not make a relay race of this. There are no more rags to clean up the mess. The tables are damp. The floor is treacherous. Laufer plays his harmonica. Parisier lies inert on a bench. Peter rests in his hammock, chewing carefully on a crust of bread. And Ash runs around with a rag, muttering to himself, there has to be a way to clean up this mess. Closing his eyes, Peter tries to summon up the crystal clear air of the mountains above Grindelsee what he would give to breathe in the smell of the woods. And then a metal hand grips the inside of his stomach and gives it a sharp twist. Where has that damn bucket gone? Okay, thanks for listening, everyone. And now um, I'd like to turn things over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for the presentation. Um, so I want to be sure there's time for people to ask their questions as well. Um, people are welcome to use the Q&A or the chat or raise their hand, and I will be monitoring all of those things. All right. So, um, and I can start with a few questions as well, what you think of some. And uh, one thing I thought about your book, actually, that was really interesting was the um, description of the boat ride to Canada. I'll start with that because we just read that part. So it's yeah. fresh in our minds. Um, because I, I get the feeling, you know, that this isn't really much talked about. There was the famous Dunera ship in Australia, which was very brutal experience by the British towards the Jewish, uh, inter the interned Jews on that boat going to Australia. And, uh, but, but I think it's interesting to think about about those terrible conditions and also how um, I think after the war, it was hard to talk about those things because um, after all, England was an ally, Canada, mm -hmm. America. And, and can you tell for people who didn't read the book a little bit about where that ship went? Well, it went to, it went to Quebec ultimately. Um, it went, the first camp um, was Quebec in, you know, on the St. Lawrence River near Quebec City. Um, so that was, that was where it ultimately went. But as I, you know, as is reflected in that passage, people just had no idea of where they were, where they were being taken. Like rumors were 
were flying as to what was going to happen to them, where they were being taken. Um, and then within Canada, there were there were several camps. Um, so my father, first he was at the one um, near Quebec City, and then he was then um, eventually he was taken to Sherbrooke, Canada. Um, but yeah, it's it's surprising to me too that. Um, as you say, it's just not a very well-known um, chapter of history, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And even, you know, even today, I mean, I, for example, I spoke to a Canadian documentarian, and he was very, you know, this new, this was all news to him still, even though it is written about, you know, there are mentions of it even in online sites, but it just hasn't been developed very fully as a, you know, as part of what happened. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a book that's yet to be written, especially about those who went to Canada. You know, mm -hmm. I know some of those stories, of course, from the Leo Beck Institute, from the archives, and I do always get the feeling there's a was a lot more trauma mm -hmm. going on than what has been left behind in the memoirs and so on. Yeah. You know, because yes. there was a hesitancy to talk about these people who ostensibly in the eyes of the world helped defeat Nazism. But yeah, of course, they had these anti-Semitic and, uh, and, and, and anti-German, you know, behavior towards these internees. Yeah, so. definitely, definitely. Then there was another thing that was, that came up in my father's internment diary where um, Canada was not necessarily expecting on the receiving end, you know, people were not expecting to be confronted by Jewish refugees. They thought they were going to mainly be getting German POWs. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the internees were also conscious of the surprise, you know, the, the surprise that they constituted arriving, you know, um, and there was even talk about, you know, banter about, well, do you think they're disappointed? You know, they're just getting Jews, they're not getting German POWs. There was, there was a lot of that. It was a very, very chaotic situation, you know. Uh, do you think it, left a, a powerful mark on him. I mean, it was a traumatic experience for him, yeah. obviously. Did he ever, I guess to use the word recover is kind of silly, but did he, was he able to come to terms with that? So well, I think, I mean, one of the things he spoke honest. about was after that situation of really being held back from life, really, you know, being sort of held in a limbo, um, when he was released and was able to, to study first at McGill, and then at Columbia, um, he was really, really keen on it. I mean, that it really made him, you know, that coming out of it, he was very, very um, motivated and very, you know, really valued the possibilities that then became open to him. Um, but, uh, but I really also think that it very much left a mark on him to have been treated, to have been treated you know, as a, to be treated as a displaced person that way, you know, yeah. Um, and it made him, I, th I mean, to me, just, if I think back memory wise, I think it made him very, uh, very sensitive to being perceived in a negative way in public situations, you know, very conscious of the possibility of being viewed um, in a negative way, and very, very much wanting to avoid that, in not being relaxed in society, I guess, is the way that I would put it. Yeah, yeah. You know? So we have a number of questions now from the audience, and um, but before we begin, I'll say one more thing. His mm -hmm. dream reminds me so much of the uh, Freudian case of little Hans. Mm -hmm. I mean, you must have thought that yourself, perhaps? I didn't really, but that's so interesting to me. Yeah, I'm going yeah, really to look at that. He also had this dream of machines coming in, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 then Freud tied that into this idea that he was scared of of castration, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and psychoanalysis. And so, it's, it's interesting to think of little Hans who was treated by Sigmund, and yeah. then your father being treated by his daughter, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think I do know that little Hans was one of the, I think maybe the only child patient, mm -hmm. um, of Sigmund Freud. But I really, I'm going to compare their dreams. Thank you yeah, for that. Yeah, please do, and get back to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be interested to know. Um, so we'll begin <clears throat> with questions. Now, the first one is uh, many parts, so we'll go through it slowly. Okay. Um, what specific algorithm, that's the word used here, did your father discover? Mm 
including Anna Freud's formative psychoanalytic foundation and your father's scholarly interest in Nietzsche's philosophy and reconstructing his agency, authenticity, and identity within a chaotic and fragmented family and alienating national political and social environment. I know oh, that's, that's a lot to handle, but you can yes. see the question in the chat. I, I, can, no, I, I can grasp it. Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. Well, first of all, I do, I do, um, when he told me that he used to look up and see the books of Nietzsche in Anna Freud's office, I thought that was so significant because he did become a Nietzsche scholar. Um, and Nietzsche was very, very key to his later intellectual development. Um, and also in my readings about psychoanalysis and Freudianism um, and also and the sort of other members of the Freud circle, um, the writings of Nietzsche were also generative for the Freudians. Um, so that's also really significant that in a way, maybe he was trying to go back to to someone that was really seen as sort of a source of one of the sources of of um, of Freud's thinking. The, in terms of how he was able to arrive at a at an algorithm or which I take to be just how he was able to internalize these influences and then recover from his own um, early experiences, that is a very huge question, um, and I don't know. I don't know if I can really provide an answer because that's sort of the mystery of a of a person's life. But, but um. But one thing that I really do, that, and that we were talking about earlier, Michael, was this: the um, what was termed, what was seen by Anna Freud as ambivalence. Um, also. Also, in my father, there was a way in which he really thrashed around with questions that he wanted to find an answer to. He was very, very, um, he was he was very, very energetic in sort of looking at the different aspects of things, turning things over. He he was very interested in paradoxes, and he was very driven in terms of trying to arrive at solutions. And there was something in that process itself that was very vitalizing to him and also to others around him. It was really a pleasure to sort of um, talk about things that were difficult with him. Um, and I think that this tremendous, he had a lot of life force, <laughs> this what I would call it, and also intense curiosity about the world and about himself. And I think that that's one of the things that was that was essential to his coming through these experiences. I think those that quality really served him well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that sufficiently answers the question, but. Yeah, I think it's interesting and we talked about this earlier, but um, to me, um, reading that book, I felt like in some ways he remained ambivalent towards life all, all his life in one way. Mm -hmm. He was trying to figure it out but he was also very, you know, everything in psychoanalysis had kind of been cooked down to analytic methods and so on that didn't leave room for much else. But I also felt that ambivalence helped him through some trying times to be just in, in some ways to be just, just an object going through these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's interesting. Another thing I wanted to say is, I again, because we talked earlier, mm -hmm. that it's interesting at the end of his life, he was dealing with civilization and its discontents. Because mm -hmm. for me, that book, that Freudian book, mm -hmm. um, also has such a Nietzschean perspective in it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I feel like that must have been this combination of Nietzsche and Freud mm -hmm. that he was working with towards the end of his life, because of course he became this, this big, very important actually Nietzsche scholar after mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that's the book he was working on at the time of his death, to me, that mm -hmm. speaks volumes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, me too. I think it's very significant. Yeah. Um, someone asked what happened? Oh, first I wanna say, I think I said earlier that people can use the chat, but I forgot we're in a webinar mode, so it's disabled. So just use the Q&A, sorry about that. Write your questions there if you've been writing them in the chat. Um, 
so what well, someone asked what happened to peter's parents to your grandparents well my grandfather um my grandfather also was able to go to england um they went separately my grandfather went a little bit later than my father did who went himself very late you know in in 1938, um, he, my father passed his Matura exam, um, and then, and then went, then essentially went to England. My grandfather went a little bit later, a couple of months later. Um, but so my, my grandfather then stayed in England and ultimately made his way over to the United States, um, and was not interned. Um, um, I mean, there's an anecdote about that where, you know, people were called to in, in London, I think, to appear um, to sort of go to line up in different places. And this, the family legend is that my grandfather saw those big lines forming and said, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not standing in line. I'm not waiting. You know, I'm not going to, to do that. Um, so whatever his thinking was at that moment, whether it was sort of you know intense suspicion about what those lines were about or whether it was just unwillingness to condescend to put himself in a line you know i don't know but um but he didn't he didn't he didn't do it and he didn't have to go to canada and he eventually made his way to the united states where he restarted his the candy business that he had you know in a very different non viennese like form my father's mother um, went to Berlin, worked um, at Ufa, and then then made her way to Italy, where she actually took on an Italian an Italian name and passed off passed herself off as Italian as opposed to Jewish. Um, but then when then eventually and worked with you know very prominent with De Sica um, and others very prominent filmmakers, and then she in the end she ended up in Lausanne. Um, Switzerland. And one of the tragedies of her story, to me anyway, is that I think when she did leave my father and leave her marriage, I think that she thought at that point in her life that she would be able to come and visit him sort of whenever she wanted to ongoingly. And then the war came and really opened up this huge chasm that wasn't, I don't think that she had ever anticipated, not you know, not being able to see her son. Um, and so that that was very, to me, that seems tragic. She would write to him, she tried to communicate with him, but a, but a huge separation of time and space opened up between them. And there were times when neither of them knew where the other one was. Um, but they both, but both my grandmother and grandfather survived the war. Mm -hmm. And after the war, did they ever they, I guess they reunited with your father, but um, what was that like? I mean, was there really a reunion or had too much time passed? Were they close? Were they? Oh, you now? mean between my father and his mother? I uh, think right. they, yeah, I mean, his my father and his father were, yeah, they were in, very much in touch with each other. Um, my father and his mother did reconnect, but there was a period where she was almost, um, I mean, the, her letters to him, reflect an anxiety about seeing him for the first time because now she felt that she was no longer a young, you know, a young woman. She was now sort of moving into being middle-aged. She was afraid that she would be a disappointment to him. There were all kinds of insecurities, um, but they did see each other again. And they were also in touch with each other about writing. Um, my father would send him, uh, send her his writing and be very, um, you know, really wanting to know her opinion. I think he really respected her and admired her judgment about things, especially creative enterprises, you know, stories and novels and, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you describe a little bit what your father's professional career, his studies of Nietzsche and where he worked and so on? Oh, okay. So he worked in, um, he was at Harvard, then he, um, well, first he was at Columbia. Um, then, then after that, he went to Harvard briefly, um, and then went to the University of Massachusetts, and finally ended up at Buffalo, at Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo, in a very exciting time at Buffalo. Um, 
where many, many different, really interesting people came. Um, and his, his, um, he was in, he was in German literature, but also philosophy. Um, and I'm just, he had a lot of different, he, well, his dissertation was on Thomas Mann. Um, and he wrote many books. He, mo he wrote a lot of books and articles about Nietzsche, especially, but also many different essays on all kinds of different, um, you know, German literary figures, um, mm -hmm. Mann and Kafka. And it's hard to sum it up because it's quite a large career. Mm -hmm. um, and many of his writings are archived at Leo Beck, by the way, which mm -hmm. makes us, you know, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We're happy to have them as well. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did your father's analysis with Anna Freud end? I think that it, first of all, it ended, it ended and then it resumed. Um, but I think that they determined that it was, you know, that it had that it had come that it, it had come to an end, you know, that it was it actually ended sort of at a similar time to the ending of the school, of the Hitzing school. But I don't think that that was the cause. I think I think that she felt that he had that he had come to a point of resolution. Um, he had also um, in the case history, there's a very dramatic moment where he's able to remember witnessing the primal scene. Um, I think that that was sort of regarded as a breakthrough kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then there was, there was actually sort of what she records as a kind of relapse that was brought on by being with his mother, um, witnessing a crisis that his, that his mother was undergoing. And so then he re-entered analysis, but I guess there was a sense that, that, that crisis was then resolved, you know? I see, I see. But it is a good question. I mean, what, how do you terminate analysis, which is supposed to be interminable? I don't, that I really, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. And I feel a lot of times in psychoanalytic literature, psychoanalytic literature, at least Freudian stuff, you know, there's this aha moment. And mm -hmm. then there's kind of this basic discovery. Oh, it's because they saw the primal scene or, oh, it's because they, had these issues with their mother and castration. And then when, then it's like, now the issue is resolved. Mm -hmm. And of course, for the person being analyzed, I, yeah. I can't quite imagine they're having the same, you know, eureka moment yeah. emotionally or intellectually. But, you know, that's it's always an interesting thing, how, how it ends kind of with this, boom, oh, we did it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have found that before. Yeah. Um, but it, just to say one, to say one more thing, it did seem to end at the time that he was entering puberty. I mean, he, you know, it really, it's interesting because his child, the childhood um, years were really in both in psychoanalysis and um, and at the Hitzing School. And then, as he's entering puberty, he goes to public school. The Hitzing School closes, um, and and his analysis comes to an end. And then his young manhood is all about the exile and the complete displacement of everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, someone asked, did I get it right that the Germans were allowed to go up the deck to POWs, but the intern Jews were not? Yes, yeah. that is in the internment diary and lots of complaining about it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, to your question, Teresa, I asked this, the name of the person who asked it. I mean, it, 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 like everywhere, I think England was quite anti-Semitic as a general rule. I don't know. We're in Europe. Of course, it erupted in a specific horrifying way in Central Europe. But certainly um, uh, last year we had an exhibit. We still have one traveling about the kinder transport. So, of course, a lot of those children went to England. And you really see there this the anti-Semitism in England. It wasn't the story of people happily taking in these children, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but th that goes into actually what we were saying earlier, this idea that that England or the Allies or America, too, were so accepting and helpful towards these uh, towards Jewish refugees. But, that wasn't mm. true. I guess that's... And just one more point to that, though. Also, it's true that the German POWs were under the rubric of the Geneva Convention, and the status of the Jewish refugees 
in terms of the Geneva Convention was much more ambiguous. And so there were certain, you know, there was a, there was a sense, at least among the refu the Jewish refugees, that they they weren't as protected by the laws that as the German POWs, which of course made them really, <laughs> it was extremely upsetting. And and then also another another thing was that that they were thrown in with the German POWs in the first place. They actually had to mount a kind of a protest to. Um, to sort of push, they had to push to get separated out when they were in the in the internment camps, and it finally did happen. But mm -hmm. before that, they had to deal with a lot of German POWs, just you know, living alongside them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Crazy. Kindertrand, I knew someone who was interned as well, and they were interned on Isle of Man. They were mm -hmm. Jewish. They'd come on Kinder transport, but of course, most of the people were were uh, real. Uh, uh, non-Jewish Germans, and many of them were, were actually Nazis who were just caught yeah. in England on vacation or for work. Now they were stuck there. So the mm -hmm. fights and, the, and the, the hostility were sometimes really awful. Mm -hmm. um, how did your father's difficulties affect you? Mm. That's, That's another a big question. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I can answer that. I mean, he... I mean, to, I don't know how I can put that in in a nutshell. Um, I mean, I okay. I guess I have one place where I can talk about it quite simply, which is he was he would he was a very um, he was a very amazing kind of father, but he did have. He he was prone to having rages when he felt that he was out of control of things, um, and those were those were quite frightening. You know, um, it wasn't a matter of cruelty; it was a matter of really, really losing his temper. Um, and f and if I think about it, I think it came out of a feeling of helplessness in those moments, and that, of course, was something that did affect me both as something that I was. You know that that's something that's scary to grow up with, but it wasn't. But I, at the same time that I'm singling that out to sort of talk about something that affected me, I f I don't want to leave out everything else about him that was incredibly um, sustaining and nurturing and inspiring, um, and very life affirming. So you know I I don't want to create an unbalanced sort of picture of what he was like. Um, but I do think that his, you know, he was very, anything that made him feel as though he was going to be seen in, in a way that was not dignified, um, was very, was very difficult for him to take. He didn't approach things like that with, with humor, which, and he did approach many, many other things with humor and with playfulness. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, once someone asked, did your father get rid of that terrible dream? And I think at that at the point with this question, which is a very good, valid question for sure, I wonder if you can talk about his return to Austria and climbing up the sidewalk. Oh, that okay. Up on the curb, because that kind of ties into it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think he did. He he was, you know, that the recurring nightmare, I guess the the clinical term for it is pavor nocturnus, night terrors. Um, he did overcome the night terrors, um, but he always remembered that dream and he would always, you know, he would tell me about it, tell, tell all of us about, about it. Um, it remained in his memory. And so, yeah, at the end of the book, I, I described this moment where we were in Austria, in Vienna together, um, and we were walking in the park where the dream was set and he told me the dream, even though he had told it to me before, you know, he sort of said, um, he sort of told me the way that people tell something that they've already told without their memory that they've told it to many times. But then he did sort of step up onto the curb and said, this is all I had to do. <laughs> you know, all I had to do was step up on this curb and everything would have been all right. So I write about that in the ending of the book, you know, that he... Um, just a moment of thinking, oh, how simple it could have been, but it was, yeah, 
Yeah. That's sort of like imagining how simple your life could have been if you hadn't lived it the way that you did. So right, right. Or by living at an intensive psychoanalysis, perhaps. Right. <laughs> well, it's a fictive, it's a fictive moment. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, did your father feel that Anna's psychoanalysis was helpful? Um I mean, I think that he. I think that he did. I think that it's also clear that it was because if, because she really, her constancy and her, you know, the fact that she was such a stable, constant presence in his life, someone that was so attentive to him and that listened to him and cared about him and that he saw every day was a very, very grounding um, element of his existence. And, and his life, I think at that was, you know that she brought a lot of cohesiveness to his life that was that was very very important at that time mm -hmm. um at the same time i think it was problematic because he couldn't ever really have her she couldn't just be his the way that a mother can be you know he and he was conscious of that uh so i think that that was very that that was very difficult mm -hmm. but to me, there's no question that she brought st a stability to his life at a time when he was really, um, you know, where he really had no, had, didn't have his mother, didn't have his mother to turn to. Mm -hmm. um, did do you know if he discussed with Anna Freud at all about the the rising of Hitler's popularity in Austria? I'm I, not sure. I don't. Yeah. Well, no, actually, there are elements, there are dreams um, in which, yes, I'm sorry, in the case, his, in the case notes, um, she mentions dreams that have to do with, with Germany versus Austria, will Austria be sort of swallowed up by Germany, or will Austria not, you know, um, and the analysis sort of talks about the fact that that question becomes kind of becomes part of the family romance um, because he's also wondering where his mother will end up. And that sort of depends on, she has two lovers, which lover will she go with and where will they live and how far away from him will she be? So, so there's a Germany versus Austria sort of dream and kind of dialectic that goes on, but it's also re you know, it's fed back into the family romance by Anna Freud in her in her writing about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in the air. I mean, politics are in the air. In when you read his dreams, you can see the unfolding of political events. I mean, it's influencing what the material that he's dreaming about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's the, uh, the ultimate Freudian question: What about your own mother's relationship with your father? Oh, you mean in terms of Freudianism? Well, uh, they don't say more than that in the question, but um, literally your mother's relationship with your father. But I think what okay. they're getting at is, uh, is uh, I guess if that was a healthy relation, I mean, I would think the idea would be from a Freudian perspective, like he grew up without a mother. So maybe that played into it okay. in some ways or. It's a great question. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is that my mother was, she was skeptical about Freudianism and about um, the introspectiveness of it and the constant self-examination and self-probing. And I think that that was actually somewhat liberating for my father that she, you know, even though he studied it, pursued it, thought about it, thought about himself sometimes in those kinds of terms, um, the fact of living with someone who would sometimes say, oh, what is all of this? This is too much, too much in, of this kind of stuff. Um, who could be sort of dismissive about it was actually quite freeing for him. Um, mm -hmm. Not that he adopted that way of seeing it himself, but it, I think it was, I think it was quite freeing that, you know, he wasn't he wasn't with someone who had been raised in that kind of thinking or who found it to be the most generative way of thinking and who could you know who could argue against it and resist it 
Um, so I think that that was actually a very, a very healthy part of their relationship. Yeah. You know? Uh, here's a comment. I'll just read it quickly. My father was a young man when he left London in 1939. He experienced a lot of anti-Semitism growing up there and described getting beaten up virtually every day coming home from school. He ended up in Montreal and when the war broke out, he wasn't able to go back. He could get back. He came to America and met my mother in Cleveland, Ohio, where they made their home. He always felt guilty that the large family he left went through the bombings and real hardship and he wasn't able to help. I think he would have coped better over the years with therapy. Thank you so much for this presentation. Looking forward to reading your book. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank um, did you. your father visit Vienna often after the war? And what was his relationship towards Austria? Very, it was a complex relationship, but over the years he, I mean, initially, he didn't, but then over the years he did visit Austria, and also, you know, they had a place in in Grindelsee that that what I that I mentioned in the very that that comes up in that last passage that I wrote. Yeah, that um, passage actually, I love that passage. It was so vivid and this strange, it really kind of exposed kind of the the I don't know, I want to say strange, but the parent child relationship and sexuality and so on, and I, mm. I love that part where she has this other lover and then she has her son there too. Yes. Trying to yeah. navigate that. Yeah. So that place, that place was, they had a beautiful house there, which my grandfather subsequently sold, which upset my father very much. Um, but that place was very, very beloved by him. And he ended up in later years going back there, you know, um, going to Grindelsee and, and spending time there. Um, and climbing the same mountains that he had climbed as a boy and really, really loving it. But when he went there, he would also encounter, you know, people that he remembered from his past, people that had, I remember being in a restaurant there with him and and the manager of that place coming up to him and apologizing to him for having been supportive of the Nazis, you know, and really saying, I'm really sorry that I, that, that I took that position. I apologize to you. And I remember my father saying, if your apology is really sincere, I accept it. And it was kind of an amazing moment for me to, to sort of see, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that when he went back, he always was um, re-encountering um, either people who had, who had been supportive of Nazism or, you know, feeling it, the possibility of, of the same anti-Semitism still in the air. So... He was very, you know, he was really a Viennese person. Um, so going back there also had that element of coming to a place that he knew so well, but also there were all the other elements too. So there's a case of ambivalence that I think is completely, you know, justified and could not be seen as part of a pathology at all. It seems almost inevitable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting to think about because I do think if there's two themes in the book to me, it was ambivalence. Mm -hmm. He's just put in these situations, but also prophecy. And we, I know in the book we talked about that, like where he, or we've talked about it privately, where he has dreams and uh, in the end, he feels kind of prophetic, like, like this dream had a prophetic aspect, let's say, like when he him and his friend have to clean the train station mm -hmm. uh, as an example when they have to leave Vienna but of mm -hmm. course he was never allowed to think of dreams beyond a very clinical what I would think of as a kind of cooked down Freudian structure mm -hmm. and so so I think so I think in a way it, it's interesting his life and how prophetic some of these dreams and themes became for him like reading this book about stateless people when mm -hmm. at that time who would ever have thought mm -hmm. he would be stateless? Yeah. You know? yeah. And so I think in that way it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, I think so just I think, if I can if I can say one more thing about sure, that. Of course. I think the place, maybe a a meeting place for those two themes would be the theme of writing, because I think it was through writing that he constantly was trying to make trying to make meaning out of out of his experience. And it was so important to him almost at every phase from when he was a little boy to when he was in, you know, interned. Um, 
And I mean, one of the crisis moments in his internment really struck me. It, it's a point where he can't figure out how to write. He can't, he's struggling to find a, a way of expressing himself authentically because it's his, it's his way of making sense of his own experience. And he feels cut off from the possibility of saying something true. Mm -hmm. and, and it and that's the form that this kind of internal crisis takes. So I think, I think that's the place where those two themes kind of come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think we'll end there. I want to thank everyone for being with us today. Uh, fascinating book. So thank you, Vivian, for writing it. Thank you. Thank and, uh, you. Many people have said they're excited to uh, read the book, and uh, I thank you for writing it as well. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.